Hello again and welcome to another episode of the Aaron X podcast. I'm Craig Eason from Fathom World and your podcast host. Now in this episode we go to Spain, to Barcelona, because it's here that a relatively young company has begun to make waves, having now installed a wind assist technology on a second vessel as it pushes ahead with its plans to join the growing market for fossil fuel free power solutions. The company is bound for blue, founded in 2006, but not by nautical engineers, but aeronautical ones who had an original dream of using wind power in vessels to create electricity, and that electricity generates renewable fuels. Over the last 15 years, the company has not only adapted its plans, focusing on the energy potential of a rigid wing sail solution, and how it can be a solution into the maritime market, but managed to go from strength to strength. Entrepreneurs and those with novel ideas will know all too well how hard it is to get traction in a new market. There is the overwhelming and continual need to raise financial support to be able to focus on a challenge while also looking at winning grants or investment from angel investors or venture capitalists, or as so many will also know, from families, friends and fools. But even with initial financial support, the challenges never go away. Startup financing inevitably is for research and development or for specific projects. It's not always for commercialization. At some point, any company with a product to sell has to take an idea on paper or a software design program and move from scale models to demonstration projects to then sourcing, contracting, materials, suppliers and construction, assuming that the orders will come. It's called the valley of death and where an entrepreneur startup with a fantastic product could easily become stuck and fold. The product is tested, the product's ready and all that's needed is the markets to buy it. And if the product is an extremely visible one and the market is traditionally very conservative, the challenge is all the greater. And this is where Bound for Blue is now. It's got a second system installed and is now investing in ramping up. It's been successful in raising money, but knows it needs more. So I spoke to two of the co-founders about the journey so far, and how they're ramping up, particularly how they look for suppliers to make the systems, ensure they have the funding to move forward and expand. Christina Alexandri is COO, Chief Operating Officer, and David Ferrer is Chief Technology Officer, CTO. My first question to Christina was how they got their first moonshot idea to look at clean energy production, and then were able to adapt it to providing clean power solutions for shipping and still keep their initial investors enthusiastic. I think that the point is that we are all aeronautical engineers, so we saw that the sailing had a huge power. So we saw that uh, in our industry, there was like this solution for the maritime industry. But the thing is that we had an even bigger idea. So it was a moonshot. Uh, and we thought applying these wing sails to produce hydrogen and oxygen in a renewable way and uh, with a lower cost than the current methods today. But then we realized that we we had a solution. We had uh, invented uh, a modern sail that could be applied directly for shipping to reduce their fuel consumption and emissions. And that's exactly uh, what we've done. And how this idea came up, it was uh, Jose watching a documentary on the ancient use of uh, sailing. That's and, Jose uh, Bermudez, by the way, the CEO of the yes. company, one of, one of the three co-founders. And uh, he just uh, explained the idea to us and he was like, let's do it. Uh, you, you, okay, you say let's do it as if it was just, I don't know, making a toy boat and putting it in a lake or something. But, you know, making a vessel, um, even at that stage, you know, making a vessel particularly to um, generate the electricity to create hydrogen, that's no small feat. So even at that point, okay, you've changed direction since. But how did you then go about trying to realize that moonshot dream? How did you manage to go and even talk to any finances, backers or um, anybody like that to say, hey, look, we've got this moonshot wild idea, but hey, how about it? We started with different uh, projects during university. So my final project career was about the first concept of Pound for Blue, generating hydrogen and the use of these sails to generate energy. And uh, we followed up engaging with uh, bigger companies like in like the National Center here of Hydrogen in Spain. And we started developing uh, projects with other research institutions too, to find if there was a 
viable uh, way to perform it in terms of uh, technology and in terms of costs. And uh, we, we, it took us like about one year and a half to realize that it was uh, really possible and to really nail it and uh, find the best solution. So the, I still remember that the first idea we had was uh, storing this energy in batteries, but then we realized it was not that efficient. So we even uh, went a step uh, farther and uh, we didn't only study hydrogen, but also ammonia and uh, other types of fuel to store this uh, energy. And uh, then later on, we realized it was a very big, big project which uh, needed a huge amount of financing and that we could uh, market our sales, which were also going to be used to, to generate this energy um, and get some revenue also from it. So, so we divided the project uh, in these two phases. And the first part, like the first funding that entered into Bound for Blue was to fund this moonshot. So it was not for the sales uh, to reduce uh, fuel consumption in shipping, but rather to produce energy. So quite curious in that. So you then realised that, OK, we've got these sail designs and perhaps we can move faster and quicker with the design of these sails into the industry. How did you go about that? You must have gone to your investors and said, hey, look, we're changing our path now. Um, how do you go to people that are organisations that are investing in Bound for Blue um, and say, look, this is what we're going to do now? I think that at that stage, what we had inside the company as shareholders were uh, business angels um, that were more open minded. They were not the VCs like more focused on a thematic or or market. And it was pretty simple, simple because um, when we had confidence later on, I asked them why did they invest in Bamford Blue? And it was not because of uh, what we wanted to do, our moonshot, which obviously had sense, but because of the team behind. So they believed that uh, if it was, it had sense for us to divide the project and to focus on this stage, then they were going to support us in this decision. So I believe that it was because we did it at an early stage with not that much shareholders and because they believed more and they funded the company because of the team rather than because of what we had, because it was more like a PowerPoint and a lot of uh, data that we had and analysis, but there was not a physical thing behind. So, so there was a high risk. So they were investing more on the team and the confidence that uh, we could provide them rather than what we had achieved at that moment. So, so David, um, you're the CTO, so you've got the, uh, the the finger on the technology of these two sails that you've got. You've got an e-sail and a wing sail design. Um, the e-sail is currently on two vessels. Can you tell me how you came up with these designs, um, the differences between them? Let's, let's talk a little bit about the differences as well or how they work as well and what they um, how they differ so that we can get a picture of where you see them being applied within the maritime sector. OK, yeah, we, we started with what we call the foldable wing sail, which is being, let's say, very simple. It's just like an airplane wing uh, installed in vertical, uh, so completely passive, etc. The thing is that there it's aerodynamic characteristics makes it necessary to uh, for it to be a little bit larger, so they have to be foldable. This can be an advantage or can be a disadvantage depending on the vessel, because if your vessel does require uh, the folding or the collapsibility of your sail, uh, it's a great advantage. But analyzing in, in detail the whole market, what we saw is that some vessels do need the collapsibility and other vessels do not need it uh, if you're able to have a, a not very large system. Having a, a not very large system means having a larger lift coefficient. This is the capacity of producing uh, thrust per square meter. That's the same size. way as if an airplane wing, if it was horizontal, would create the lift. Exactly. The airplane. Okay. So we were looking at uh, how can we make a high lift device? Uh, and basically there are two technologies that can do that, the flatner rotors and the suction sails. And after analyzing both technologies, we saw that the that the e-sail or the suction sail uh, was uh, the best option. So we started developing that like three years ago. Um, and basically it's a system that has a higher lift coefficient and this allows us to have a smaller sail. So having a smaller sail has uh, advantages like this, their size is smaller, so less air draft, less weight, less mechanism, less cost, and you can put more units on a vessel because the interference with visibility, lights, etc., is lower. So on uh, wide, 
large amount of uh, the vessels in the market that we're focusing, uh, this is the best solution. We do have the two technologies because some vessels do need foldability. So in that case, we would offer the, the foldable wing sail. What's the technology with the suction sail then? How does it, why is it called a suction sail? It's uh, basically the, the, the limitation on a sail uh, is when the flow detaches from, this, from, from its surface. So with the suction, basically what you're doing is to suck a little bit of air at the point where the flow would detach to keep it uh, attached to the, to the sail. So thanks to that, you can go to different shapes and, and different positions of the sail uh, without this detachment. Uh, which allows you to get higher lift coefficient. So that that requires a sort of motor or something to be able exactly. to create. You need, that exactly, you need a fan that sucks uh, the air from the what we call the boundary layer. D don't think about we are sucking all the air from the external uh, part of yeah. the sail. We're just uh, sucking a small amount to keep it attached. But yeah, you you need some electric power. So you've you've managed to um, secure two. Um, I, I would call them demonstration. Uh, projects because I think when we look at the the um, the wind assist industry as it stands today, there's still a lot of feeling of the nascency of the industry and the need for it to um, get as many demonstrations, as many real vessels out on the water to show that the technologies work. So these are the are two. Um, one of them is this um, rather novel theatre vessel that you've just uh, announced you're installing on, and there was a an earlier vessel as well, wasn't it? A fishing vessel or yeah, yeah. something That's with it. the with the two. So you've got your you're building up experience now with the e sail. So what about the wing sail? When are we expecting to see a first wing sail of yours on the water? Well, I, I said uh, the the vast majority of the market, it's uh, it's uh, the e sail is going to be more suitable for them. So so in fact, our focus right now is to do these piloting projects on the different types of vessels that we consider relevant for the market. Uh, and uh, being the fishing vessel, one of them, the general cargo, like the theater vessel is the other one. We're now uh, moving forward on, on different types of vessels, tankers, uh, bull carriers, uh, larger general cargo vessel, a row, row, et cetera. Uh, and depending on the requirements of the vessels that we're gonna find uh, as uh, these, uh, let's say early adopters willing to do these, uh, these piloting projects, um, we will select the, the optimal technology. In fact, in fact, we are not, what, what we're selling is wind assisted propulsion uh, uh, systems to our customers. Our first step is to analyze for them uh, what is what we call the optimal wing assisted propulsion configuration for your vessel, depending on your requirements. Uh, and one of the first thing is selecting which is the best technology for your case. So, so it's gonna be a case by case or depending on the vessel that is coming. Uh, we will select one uh, one uh, technology or the other. So that's going to depend a little bit on the market. Well, one of the biggest challenges that we've seen with any um, sort of engineering startup like Band for Blue or any, any of the others is the incredible amount of costs up front for a company, particularly when you go from this, and I think this is where you are, you're at the point where you've got the demonstrations in the water, you've gone from the research and uh, design and development stage and you're now in this kind of almost at the cusp of this commercialization realization sometimes it's called the valley of death you need to get this money in to be able to fulfill orders if they come in but until you get the orders you haven't got the money to about christina how are you looking at that um kind of conundrum of being able to expand into the market a market which we see there's growing appetite but at the same time, you realize you need the capital to be able to ramp up manufacturing, find the suppliers, build in the partners that you need for that construction phase. So in order to get uh, to install the first unit, the fishing vessel, we, we we needed like about 5 million euros for the company. And then during the summer of 2021, we raised 5 million euros to perform the last installation and a farther ones. And this forms part of a bigger funding round uh, of 20 million euros coming around the half of it from the European Innovation Council. So Bound for Blue is one of the uh, companies that is going to receive this funding. And this funding will not only enable us to go to bigger uh, vessels to, to perform more than one sales on uh, installation, some vessels, um, and that uh, implies also uh, going to the commercial stage. So that's uh, funding to reach uh, 
this um, and go through this valley of death. Do, do you see this being a, a big challenge in terms of finding the technology firms that you can then trust um, with your with your concept? Because to a certain extent, I, I imagine that you are not the ones that are going to be building the wing sails. You're going to be using some suppliers to build the wing sails, to, to provide the software, to monitor, because I believe one of the things, and I've seen this across the, across the industry, there's a sort of... Um, savings kind of sharing arrangement so to pay for the system which again must limit the amount of income you get unless you've got some some sort of go between so when, when it comes to the suppliers david who's going to build your uh, wing sales who's going to build your e-sales yeah just uh, as uh, what you're saying we, we are uh, within bow for blue we, we are retaining what what adds value so so what we're retaining is the engineering the design of the sales of the autonomous control system, of the performance uh, monitoring uh, software, et cetera, et cetera. But the manufacturing, uh, I mean, there are plenty of companies around the world, in Europe especially, um, that are experts in, in large uh, steel and, and, and metallic uh, structures manufacturing. So we are doing our design already for, since the beginning with the idea of how can we manufacture that in an easy, cheap, uh, way, uh, which can in fact not only be manufactured as a single unit, but somehow in a production line. So just to give you an example, the e-sale itself, it's uh, basically a, a tube, what we call a, a, mono, a monocoque structure. So it's basically a tube, which is very similar to the tower of um, of the wind, uh, of the wind turbine. Wind turbines. Yeah. So it's basically like a tower. Okay. It could have been improved in terms of weight. Uh, there are other technologies, etc. But if you want to manufacture them, uh, like in, in in a production line, this is very useful because there are many companies in Spain that are specialized in manufacturing these uh, offshore uh, technologies. So they they perfectly know on how to manufacture that quick, uh, cheap, and especially with a high quality. Uh, and this this gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of what you were saying, scaling up, scaling up how you're going to go from the prototype to the uh, to several units. So we can do that with these companies. They already have the experience, and it's a good way also of let's say scaling up in terms of uh, of uh, geo in, in terms of geography. We can manufacture in Europe for Europe, but we can manufacture in Asia for Asia. Uh, so, so we think that going with this kind of suppliers gives us a lot of flexibility and, and speed ups our uh, the the commercialization of the technology. I, I would also say that uh, for the shipyards, it's pretty similar. So they don't need extra capabilities to install the technology. So it's something they are used to. So similar to a crane boom. And then also regarding the maintenance uh, activities that uh, the sale would need, these companies that are manufacturing our sales also have the capabilities to offer the maintenance because they're doing it at the worldwide level for wind uh, turbines. So that's something that uh, makes it uh, really easy in order to scale up the company. As you go into 2022, having have it had this, um, I'd, I'd say, quite progressive 2021, I think there's a lot of people that had a very bad 2021. It sounds like you had an extremely good one in terms of um, the development of Bound for Blue. So. How are you going to make further inroads into the maritime sector? How do you find the appetite for your services in a sector that has traditionally been extremely conservative? I would say that when we started, at least, uh, there was more, much more resistance than now. And I believe this has to do also with the International Maritime Organization regulations, the ones that are coming up. And uh, therefore, uh, we are seeing uh, quite a different uh, perspective in the market. We have the first installations, and that has been really, really useful. I mean, for the Naumon vessel, it's a small cargo vessel, in fact. And uh, 
by installing our technology there, we have had a lot of inquiries regarding installations on that segment. So as soon as we have uh, the first installations on the different types of segments that uh, David mentioned before, that really opens much more doors than what we had at the beginning of Bound for Blue. There's been a huge uh, mindset, in fact, uh, in the industry when, when we started in 2014, uh, they were kind of, the, the chip owners, they were willing to listen basically due to the regulations that were going to come into in, but but they, they were like, well, this is a nice PowerPoint, but, but we'll see. Now that there's been a shift in the mind, in the mindset, I think everyone in this industry assumes and accepts that wind propulsion is going to be there and it's just about which technology is the best one. So having these pilots uh, helped a lot to position Bound for Blue as a viable option. So we're getting a lot of interest from, from the from the market. Also, something that uh, really helps is offering the technology not only as a hardware, but as a service. So rather sharing these savings with an external investor. And uh, at the beginning for Bound for Blue, it was uh, very difficult to engage with these investors. We had no data of the installations. We, we had neither developed the technology. But now at that point, uh, we've been uh, throughout the last uh, years working with uh, private investors and uh, bigger VCs, funds in order to offer this technology as a service, which obviously uh, increases the market uh, acceptance and adoptance of the technology. Are you finding that um, the competition is growing with you? I, well, it's true that there are plenty of, uh, let's say, of uh, potential suppliers, obviously uh, at different levels of development. There, there are many suppliers that are at the same level as we were back in 2014, so they have an idea and a PowerPoint. At a level where we are with already installations, there are just a handful of, uh, of options. Uh, and as I always say, for me, it's positive to have this kind of competence right now, because uh, as I said, this uh, shift in the mindset has been done thanks to successful installations. Uh, so any installation right now of any competitor just gives more confidence in the wind and sister propulsion industry. So it helps us. So right now I'm really happy of any success of, of the of the other technologies. Uh, I cross my fingers that there will not be any uh, failure because that's also going to affect everyone. Uh, but right now I'm, I'm, I'm really happy. So, so we, we collaborate with uh, with this with, with uh, this competence in, in other in projects. In, fact, in the International Wind Super Association, in the end, we are collaborating all together. This is the Aranax podcast, the podcast about the transformation of the shipping and ocean space. That was David Ferrer and Christina Alexandri, two of the co-founders of Bound for Blue in Spain. And if you want to know more about the technology, there's links in the show notes and on fathom.world, where you will find a growing list of stories about wind assist and new wind propulsion systems that are reshaping shipping. There's a growing back catalogue of podcast episodes as well, where I've spoken to other companies and entrepreneurs building up wind assist or full sail solutions, doing their own thing to help shipping decarbonise. Recently, Di Gilping joined me after returning home from a fruitful visit to COP26 in Glasgow. And last year, I spoke to Daniel Doggett, who's leading Sail Cargo, a team building a sailing ship in the jungles of Costa Rica, which will sail green cargoes up and down the west coast of the USA and Canada. I've also spoken to Vilinius Willemsen in Scandinavia about the Ocean Bird concept, a wind-powered car carrier. Another company with some bright ideas on paper, Bar Technologies in the UK, were also guests, and Airseas, the French company with a huge kite solution, has also featured, as has Econowind in the Netherlands, and Blue Technology, an idea in Denmark for a full-sail cargo vessel and a wing sail the size of a Boeing 747's wing. All these guests and topics can be found in the back catalogue of Aranax episodes, and even more stories can be found on Fathom World, of course. Yes, shameless plug, I don't care. That's really what this podcast is about, promoting the news and stories that are transforming the maritime and shipping industries. Now, there have been a few other stories making the news over the last week. The International Renewable Energy Association has published new data and a report pointing to how green hydrogen production can become a real game changer as new hydrogen trade routes open up and traditional refined hydrocarbons decline. 
And finally, the Global Maritime Forum, the Danish organisation rapidly becoming one of the driving forces pushing the decarbonisation agenda, notably through its Getting to Zero coalition, has published a report outlining what it sees as policy measures to close the competitive gap between clean fuels and fossil fuels. GMF said in its press release that there needs to be price parity between the fuels to encourage take-up. New fuels such as hydrogen, ammonia and methanol are being seen as fuels of the future for different shipping segments, but their production using renewable resources is still more costly than the tax-free bunkers used today. Ship owners won't turn to these fuels unless they feel that first, it's something every other owner is doing, and secondly, and that it will not hurt their pockets. GMF's key idea is, of course, a carbon price on fuel, starting low and gradually ramping up to $200, and then a market-based measure with revenues generated to help the transition. Well, that's it for this episode of the Aronex podcast. Many thanks for downloading and listening, and come back next time for an interview, hopefully with someone working to build a fleet of hydrogen-powered exploration cruise ships. So subscribe, follow and like this podcast, share it with your friends and colleagues, And you can also become a Patreon of the podcast, helping support its growth. And remember also to visit Fathom World, where you can read more news about the transformation and transition, and subscribe to the Fathom World newsletter. That's it for this episode. Goodbye.